Okay, so I'd like to welcome our final speaker for the day. This is Gary Nichols from Nautilus Limited, who's going to talk about make, well, accessible field work in a professional training environment. Right, thanks very much. And um, to introduce ourselves, Wayne has uh, contributed a couple of times to the meeting already today. Uh, since he says he's got a background in field studies and is uh, currently the uh, health and safety manager at uh, Nautilus. Um, I'm Managing Director of Nautilus um, and I'll explain a bit more about what we do uh, in a moment. But on the theme of this meeting, uh, I started, uh, uh, my earlier career was as, a, as an academic, I was a university lecturer, and the first year um, I encountered a research student uh, and uh, she was just completing her PhD, uh, but she had no uh, right hand. Um, I still know this, this person. Um, she has had a full career reaching a very high level uh, in, in the oil industry uh, and uh, you know, obviously being one-handed has raised some issues for her at times but it does not seem to have been any sort of barrier to, to her success. So in talking about um, the industry view, employer's view, what we can talk about really is how we see field training uh, for the, the industry, in specifically the oil and gas industry here. Uh, Norsus is part of the uh, RPS group, a large consultancy group, and we provide training courses, professional training courses, and these are different levels across this, this whole spectrum of geology, geophysics, etc., etc. Now, a big part of what we do um, for these companies, so you recognize a lot of um, famous company names there. We, we actually um, provide training for well over 100 companies worldwide. So uh, in terms of our sort of outreach to the industry, uh, we, we're pretty well placed. Um, our real unique selling point, as far as training is concerned, is, is field training. Um, We've, there's our statistics, 16 years of experience, over 800 field courses run. We've taken 13,000 odd people out into the field. And um, last year, Wayne had the, the joy of supervising 105 field courses being taken worldwide run by uh, our organization. I should explain that what we do is we're, we're a training management company. We contract tutors, they may be academics, they may be industry professionals, they lead the, the field trips from a technical point, point of view. We run the field trips from a, from a logistical point of view and from a health and safety point of view. So what, what's our experience then of providing field work, providing professional level field work for, for, for CPD and what are the sort of learnings that we can, we can pass on, which I think uh, could be of, of interest? And before this, these categories in terms of sort of planning, reconnaissance, provision, action, improvement, and I'm going to focus mainly on those first two because they're really the core of making sure that we have a successful uh, field trip but, mo but a successful field trip for everybody involved. And this, I want to emphasize, can be inclusive. And in fact, should be inclusive. And I think our, con our uh, conclusion is it must be inclusive of, of anyone that we can. So this is, this is our desired outcome. This is someone uh, who is completely wheel wheelchair bound, taking part in a field trip run by, by Nautilus um, in Utah uh, and working alongside his peers in his same company or in other companies. We, we run many of our courses off of mixtures of people from, from, from different companies. So we want to make sure that we've got processes in place, information in place, practices in place to ensure complete accessibility as far as it can be achieved. Core to this, and the starting point, is a fieldwork planning. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the things involved here, 
uh, about how we you know, gather evidence, you look at what potential issues there are, hazards, risks, things which are always, always important to remember, and these are mentioned earlier as well, about the competence of your leaders. We operate by having a leadership team. We have the tutor who is responsible for she or he providing the, the academic, the geological aspects, the learning aspects of that field trip. But we always have one of our staff present to act as logistics manager for that, that field course. So they look after all aspects of the day-to-day -day running of it, and they will have played a part in the planning process, and as a company, we will have planned and carried out reconnaissance before a field trip goes anywhere. So any field trip we take anywhere, there will always be a, a significant amount of planning about every location that we're taking anybody. So when we're, we're talking about this planning in relation to someone who has some particular needs. And the core bit of information is, well, what do they want to get out of this field, field course? They will have read their course outlines, which just describe what the main learning outcomes are. Um, and we want to first enter a discussion and say, well, what are the most important learning outcomes for you? And then, what are the limitations on what you are able to do? What are your physical limitations or perhaps mental limitations? And then we can try to make sure that the aspirations of the person are as far as possible met. And it's all about discussion. And we were talking this issue about disclosure earlier. The more information that we have, the more we work with the person who has those needs, the more, more chance we are of them having, being able to achieve what they want and what we want, which is a satisfying experience of, of learning what they wanted to learn. So detailed knowledge is required, and that can only be required, uh, acquired by, by dialogue, by uh, gathering that information. So it's, it's not so, so much a matter of saying to somebody, you know, well, what's your disability? It's much more a matter of saying, well, what can you do and what, what, what would be difficult? And because we know in detail about every location, it's all documented, it's all in a database, we're able to talk well, and say, OK, at this location, it is so many metres walking. This is the nature of the ground that you would be moving over. This is the slope of that ground. We, we have collected those data so that we can then talk to this person in an informed way and say, well, would you be able to cope with this? And then we, that get, provides us the basis for planning from the start on the access that they will be able to, to achieve. And we may decide we need additional support. Um, and you have to think, you know, we are a training company, we do have to think about insurance and whether there are any particular issues which arise as a result of that. And the reconnaissance, as I say, we always do a reconnaissance uh, of, of, an, of an area. And there's some of that reconnaissance is very obvious, but as been mentioned earlier to, today, there are aspects of transport and accommodation which are actually just as significant as whether the person can actually get to that point in the field. So the, the field access vehicles that you're using, uh, these ones being used in Turkey provide good access for someone with limited mobility. They, they have double opening doors and you would be able to uh, access that. This one on, on our, one of our field courses in Borneo, you know, an able-bodied person struggles to get up into that little bus. Uh, so you know, we might say, oh, well, it's got a minibus. They'll be able to get around. They may not be able to get in and out of that, of that bus. So we have to collect, we have to know that, we have to have that information about the nature of the transport we're using. And it's not just vehicle transport. 
Uh, as you'll see, all these wonderful places we do fields at Bahamas. So it's a great jolly, isn't it? Um, no, we modern carbonates field courses. Um, we are currently running one in the Bahamas. Uh, involves pe people going out on the boats. Well, they may be able to get uh, be able to operate in the water, but are there issues we need to deal with there? But can they actually get in and out of that boat? So there's there's all sorts of things other than just the vehicle transport. There may be other aspects of transport that we need to worry about as well. Uh, this is one of Wayne's photographs from a, uh, a, a very nice sort of funky hotel uh, in, uh, in Texas. Um, nice traditional sort of ranch style accommodation. And he says he found it difficult to get in and out of those doors. Um, now, you know, someone with, with uh, some access restrictions that may have provided, presented a problem uh, to, to them as well. So, there's a, you know, so the initially, detailed knowledge. It really is detailed. You know, what, with those hotels, if they're modern ones in the UK, or in Euro, under European regulations, then they may conform to, uh, uh, to access, uh, modern access regulations. But if they're older hotels, or they're hotels in um, South Africa, or in uh, Utah, or whatever, you know, what is the uh, situation going to be in terms of whether somebody with those particular mobility restrictions uh, is able to, to use that hotel? Do they have ground, ground floor rooms? If there are upstairs rooms, is there appropriate lift? Does the lift actually take them to the rooms which have uh, accessible um, bathrooms and things like that? And so just the hotel room itself, you know, you know, we use meeting rooms because before we go out in the field and then coming back from the field, uh, we have meetings to go through and, and work on the objectives of the course. Uh, they need to be considered as well, as do where we're going to eat. Often we will eat uh, breakfast and some evening meals in the hotel that we're staying at, but sometimes we like to go out to local restaurants. They've all got to be checked as well. Can the person access the room where we're going to be eating in that hotel. And of course, those are the, the things that, you know, perhaps one wouldn't think about straight away. What one would tend to focus on, I suggest, would be, oh, getting to the access, getting, accessing the actual field locations. So, up a scree slope like that, well, quite a lot of able-bodied people can struggle getting up a scree slope like that. So, clearly, um, that would not be something uh, uh, accessible for someone with more li limited uh, ability, or with vertigo, or just um, struggled with uh, being on, on slopes at all. But are there alternatives? Can you actually achieve many of the same objectives from a distance? Does the whole party actually need to go right up to that access point? Could you actually do it by looking at loose blocks and looking across to the other side of the, uh, of the hill? We tend to make assumptions that because the way we've all done, always done it is by walking up that hill, getting stung by the hornets and all those things to, to, to see things. But actually, you can be out in the field, you can still get the same learning outcome, but perhaps by a different approach, which is less challenging for someone who has mobility restrictions or vertigo or whatever, uh, but you can still achieve essentially the same learning outcomes. It looks nice and easy um, at, a, at a roadside, shouldn't be a problem there. This is in not quite midsummer in Utah, but it's hot. You see everywhere everyone's crowded in the shade. You know, can the person with the wheelchair or whatever get into the shade as well? Or are they going to get stuck out in the heat? And the, the people who are on that trip, you know, our staff, and you know, we like to, to involve everybody in the trip with looking after everybody, you know, making sure that um, you know, the, the person uh, in the wheelchair is not the person taking that, that photo. And what's going to sometimes seem to be relatively straightforward, like, oh, it's quite flat across that foreshore. Yeah, but it's very, very uneven. And then when, we, when you are there, um, uh, you can see some big waves coming in. Now, for people with a lot of uh, fitness, 
oh, the big waves start coming in, starts getting a bit nasty. Oh, we'll just scramble up the slope and get out of that, that uh, foreshore. That may not be a possible for everyone. So knowing that that's the, the, the case, understanding the, out, um, the, the ways out of all your localities uh, is critical. And may, you may need to know alternatives. I mean, a lot of this is basic stuff that we have to know for everybody going on these field trips. It just becomes even more important to know that what your escape routes are from somewhere when it's a, uh, you're involving someone who perhaps can't move so, as quickly or easily as the rest of the party. So you know, access to outcrops is the obvious one. Um, thinking about what activity there are, are at outcrops, you know, what general equipment is required, anything specific you know, would, would um, uh, it, it help to uh, uh, provide I don't know, so ropes or something like that for someone uh, to, to make it easier for them on a, on a slope? Is this somewhere where the weather conditions might change? Go from somewhere which is, you know, a relatively benign slope in the dry, but is treacherous and slippery and potentially dangerous when it's wet. Things which are challenges for an able-bodied person, uh, but for some, you know, become ex accentuated when you have um, mobility restrictions. So understanding weather conditions, the effect that those might have, um, managing the program, considering alternative arrangement. We, we, we do, obviously we're doing risk management all the time and we're always trying to make sure that we have a plan B, that alternative arrangements, practical arrangements can be made to make sure that um, we don't get ourselves into a, an uncomfortable situation. And some people need more bathroom breaks than others. Um, need to be mindful of that, need to know where is appropriate and to have that information in advance so that when you've got a field party and someone comes up and says, look, I've got a serious problem here, the, 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 the leadership team have a solution as far as possible straight away. And having alternative plans, what are we going to do if it goes wrong? What's, what's, what's plan B? What's the backup? So part of all that planning, that re re reconnaissance, uh, etc., um, leads us to determine on the provision for that, that course. And, you know, first point, you can't emphasise more, the discussion. The engaging of the individuals with the process of the running of that course. Talk to them about the transport, the accommodation, each field location, sometimes in a great deal of detail. I mean, it it's, it's can be quite, quite time consuming, but, but doing that in advance saves so much time and potential anguish uh, la later on. And everybody has to be realistic. I mean, the, the, pers the people with some sort of disability usually are very realistic. They know what they can and cannot do. They're not expecting you know, the, the miracles of suddenly they will be able to go to the top of that mountain. So, the, you know, we also have to reflect that, be realistic with them and, and you know, um, accept when they say, no, I don't think I can do that. You know, well, that's, that's the, the situation. And it may be necessary to provide alternative activities. That's been the topic of the, of the previous uh, talk. Um, for us, it's often some, just a different set of uh, learning materials that we, could, we can provide. Um, or um, it may be we think, actually, in order for that person to take part in that, that activity, they will need some additional support. What else can we provide? Uh, do we need to provide particular transport for that location, which um, uh, we wouldn't normally use? So, you know, Obviously, we have we, you know, taking our risk assessments. We have emergency action plans. Um, you know, it's it's our business. You know, this may be uh, seem like a, you know, a lot of, of, uh, of preparation work. It really pays off though, because uh, it, it allows us to run our field trips in a, in a safe uh, and an efficient way, and also it allows us 
to make our field work uh, accessible. So that management plan is in place. Key people need to know what's going on. So we always have a leadership team, minimum of two people, the tutor and our staff logistics uh, person. And it may involve other people in the group uh, at times. But we have to uh, make sure everyone is aware of the situations. And actually, the more you can get a group of people thinking about issues, you know, um, thinking about how somebody might be helped to get to a particular uh, site. Uh, we had an instance where someone in a wheelchair was able to get to a site, but it actually required four of the guys to, to really help get that person up that steep slope. Uh, and that was fine. They were really happy to be involved in it because we'd involved everybody in the process of making sure that that person was able to take a full part uh, in, the, in the course. And uh, as I say, um, make sure not only that we've done the reconnaissance of the accommodation, transport, etc., restaurants, um, but in advance, uh, uh, letting them know, letting the hotel know, letting the restaurant know, uh, whatever, that um, we have a particular situation uh, that someone may need a bit of extra help. And part of the sort of reason we have so much information about our locations is because we have a fairly thorough process of continuous improvement. Uh, a debrief after the course, uh, Wayne oversees a process of post uh, course reports, uh, any issues that have arisen at any location or any potential issues all recorded, available for next time we run a field trip to that location. Not necessarily the same course, but the same location because we may use the same locations on different courses. That information is there. It can be acted on. It can be used. So that uh, continuous uh, improvement that's continuous use of information uh, really helps us determine for every individual case the extent of their, their participation uh, and making sure that they get as a starting point they get what they want it to do out of it so it's a very short case study the a, a field course that I was involved in in leading um, and you can see that uh, in the front row there is uh, uh, a guy in, in a wheelchair. And this is actually the first time he'd been on a, on a field trip uh, with us. Um, so we talked with him about, firstly, what did he want to achieve? We went through all the uh, information about localities, uh, our judgment about how we could access it and his responses on that. And discuss, well, um, if, if it did mean that he couldn't go to locations X and Y, would that be a big issue? What were the alternatives? And in the end, we decided that he would be able to get to um, <coughs> all but one location, which we were at for about two hours, which he couldn't get to at all, and another location where he could only get to see things from a distance rather than being close, close up to everything. Otherwise, we were able to include him in all aspects of the course. So it's in uh, northern Spain. Uh, so his participation level, i.e. what he was able to do uh, on, the, on the field course, was well over at 75%. And actually, his benchmark was, if I'm able to do 75% of the learning outcomes of this, I'll be happy with that. He says, I'm realistic. I know that I'm not going to be able to do 100%. If, if it's going to end up as less than 50, it's probably not worth my well going. So you, know, you, you can use some sort of benchmarks or parameters and say, well, you know, is this going to work for you if you do this, this, this much? So as part of reconnaissance, it's a field trip we've run many times uh, before. In fact, I've been going to this, this field area for well over 30 years. 
But the transport when you worked, the, the um, small buses that we used to transport people around were okay. Um, we'd uh, looked at all the field locations. It's something like 14 different locations. We'd done our assessment of each one, um, made adjustments to the way we accessed one of them. So instead of walking along a riverside, we drove around to a different point and went down this, this steep slope I mentioned to get to it. And the, the hotel um, was, was appropriate uh, for accommodation. But about, about 10 days before the field trip was running, one of the uh, other North Sea staff involved me said, what about that restaurant at the vineyard where we go for the final meal on the last night? I said, what's, your, what's the problem? Lance? He said, there's a spiral staircase up to it. We'd missed that. And in fact, what we did, we simply phoned up the, the uh, restaurant and said, could you use a different room to, to, to give us our meal? They said, yeah, no problem. But it would have been very, very embarrassing to have turned up uh, for that restaurant meal uh, and discovered that there was absolutely no way that that person could have uh, got up there. So I say, beware the spiral stir uh, staircase. It's, we were <laughs> lucky in a sense that we did think of it in, in ahead, but... Um, it's, it's amazing how much detail and how much care you need to take to make sure that you, you do make something fully accessible. So to include, I mean, the, is, is whether what we're providing works for the end user is what matters. You know, as we've been saying over and again today, it's from the perspective of the person involved as, to, as whether it's successful or not. We think that many aspects of geological fieldwork can be achieved with appropriate knowledge of the outcrops, thinking about access, thinking about the issues, and planning carefully for it. And you, know, you have to think about those in the context of you know, um, cost. Um, yeah, reasonable costs are uh, appropriate. And, of course... We mustn't be doing anything that, anything that puts anybody's safety at risk. You know, if by making some sort of uh, change to accommodate someone with more limited mobility, if that then has an impact on our sort of safety protocols, then that's obviously very serious. So, obviously, because we make a business out of running um, field courses for, for the industry, we're bound to say that quality field work is you know, essential. Um, what I would remind people, though, is that the field work that we provide for people in the oil and gas industry is often the only field work that those people get during the course of their job. So when thinking about whether somebody who has limited ability to do field work, whether they can go on and become a successful geologist, once they've started working in the oil and gas industry, it may be irrelevant because they have, will have hopefully learnt, if we provide accessible field course for work for them, all alternatives in their education, and we can continue to provide some accessible field work for them, but obviously not everywhere. We run a field trip to, to, to Spitsbergen. That would be very challenging for someone with any limited abilities. Pretty challenging anyway. Um, but um, you know, we, we mustn't get hung up on the idea. We mustn't let people get hung up on the idea. Say, oh, I can't do field work, therefore I'm never going to be able to have a career as a judge. She can. You know, it's, it's not going to be very much of a barrier, if any barrier at all, once they have, then have a career. And sadly, they're going to be spending most of their time uh, sat um, uh, in an office uh, rather than out in the field, which is what, uh, where, where all of, most of us want to be. So, you know, we say that um, being able to, to... But if someone wants to do that field work, we, we feel there's a duty for us to provide it. Uh, you know, it's a right really, uh, as we are going back to things we were saying, saying earlier. So our view uh, you know, is that field work is, um, field training is essential, and for people working uh, as professional geologists is something that, that can be provided. Just take some planning, take some thought, 
it can be done. Thank you. Any questions for Gary? Thanks, Gary. In a nutshell, given your comments about most people working in, particularly in, in the oil and gas sector, don't do field work as such, C can you sort of distill the essence then of why you provide field-based training? Because I think it's really important for the university sector to know this. Okay, this, this, this picture here provides that, that answer. Because these rocks are deposited as fluvial sediments uh, in, in a basin in the northern part of, of, of Spain uh, about 25 million years ago. We use those to, as analogues for people to see what uh, reservoirs in fluvial rocks might look like. If you were to base your understanding or try to base your understanding of fluvial reservoirs on seismic data and well log data alone, you would not have a clue of how to build a realistic reservoir model. You need to have seen those rocks in the field. So that's then, then the very, in fact, if you pick up Geo Expo uh, May th th this month, that article is all about that, uh, about how you, you can learn so much from remote data, but not everything. There are three dimensional relationships, the scale relationships that you could get in the field. Remember, one of the things you could do in the field, which you can't do anywhere else, is that you can go right from picking up a small bit of sandstone and looking at the grains, to looking at the scale of the bed, to looking at the scale of the outcrop, to looking back to see where the edge of the basin is. That continuum of scale of observation can actually only be achieved uh, in the field. So there is, there is undoubtedly uh, an economic reason for, for doing it, because the geologists Colin, you, <laughs> you want to say something because you know, I'm sure you'll... Yeah, you be provocative and pick up on, on Jacqueline's talk here, that there are a lot of people who are collecting high-resolution LIDAR data, photographs, put into a virtual context. Can you not appreciate the same things visually from that? Do you actually need to be in the field? You won't have seen what's the relationship between the uh, sandstones and uh, the different sandstone units there because your LIDAR will, I'm going to get really into fluvial sedimentology here, Colin, uh, your LIDAR will not pick up that there are thin sands uh, in there which have a fine grain size sufficient to actually be connectivity pathways between the coarser sandstones which works for a gas reservoir. I think, no, I, 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 technically, what you're, you're saying is absolutely possible. And I will be completely upfront is that you know, we are going in that direction of doing it. Because costs of taking people into the field affects oil industry uh, uh, as well. So you know, the, the uh, requirement uh, for apps to doing it only in the field is getting eroded by, by modern technology. You know, at the moment, it's probably easier to just take people out into the field. But, I th you know, you do have a point, is that you know, with the sort of technology that Jacqueline was, was, was showing us and, and um, uh, LIDAR, all are providing opportunities for virtual field work. However, there is, am I loud enough to be recorded, there is one aspect, though, which is the training aspect of getting people to be able to do it for themselves, and that you can't do in a virtual environment. What, what Are you sure? Are you sure you can't do it in a virtual environment? No. It's <laughs> the, I think it's the uh, interpretation. You were always telling students, don't take photographs and try and interpret that. Your eye, looking at the rock, will pick out things that no camera or LIDAR or anything, you're, they're clearly useful, um, but that basic understanding 
you kind of need to be up as close to the rock as you can be um, because the eye will pick out details I think that photographs and so on won't do which is one of the reasons I think virtual worlds they're great photographs like everything's great but nothing really replaces that being in the field and looking at that rock and interpreting with your own eye the details that you see there Um, just some food for thought, really, putting this into context, this argument. This is something that's been going on for decades in the field of planetary science. So, for example, I'm a planetary geologist studying Mars. That is not a field area that I'm personally going to be able to visit. So we do everything remotely. And whilst technology is improving, we have rovers, satellites, landers that can provide a wealth of information on the geology of the surface and the subsurface, hopefully in the near future. Anyone that works on those mission teams, and indeed the astronauts that have been up, the only astronaut that's not... Uh, part of a pilot or military system was a geologist and said there is absolutely no replacement for having a human being trained in geology in the field making those observations because you don't have that intuition when you have a robotic mission or a virtual environment. Just some food for thought. And, and I think you know, people are able to make the interpretation of the geology of the surface of Mars because of an understanding from the field of the geology of Earth. Yeah, it's you know, without that, uh, you know, other planets are more difficult to interpret because they have different uh, surface types. Mars is more similar to uh, to ours, and therefore much easier to interpret. I think where we're going here, and I know Mark's going here, is that we have to be able to capture this and be ready to articulate to people. In in all environments, all contexts, as to what it is that we can't do by not being in the field. And we tend to take it as a presumption, but of course you know why field work is important. That, and, and then that needs to be translated in, for example, to the accreditation process. Mm -hmm. so what aspects are we trying to train people in that they can't do in the laboratory? I mean, the, the thing I would say is that you, you know, there's this adage, you know, the, 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 geolog the best geologist is the one who's seen the most rocks. But why? Why do we say that? That's what you've got to articulate, because just saying it is, is not sufficient. You actually have to give precise examples of what, what you can actually learn and why it is actually more effective to learn that in the field than by substituting virtual technologies. I don't know whether I can articulate this correctly, but uh, my experience of field work is being able to work with very incomplete data sets and observe them and interpret them to come up with a meaningful model. The students often say, what, what is the true thing here? What is it we're trying to experience? And I say, well, this year it's this interpretation, but next year I might put a different slant on it because the sun is at a slightly different angle or it's raining and snowing. So the interpretation tends to vary according to the observation. And as far as I know, there's no software or system that can do that for you. The problem with um, the virtual system, I think they're fantastic as a training device, don't get me wrong, I was really impressed by that. Um, it's, it can't give you that milieu that you need to give the full experience. Uh, the that, the, that's a big issue. The, the question has been asked um, before about why does the industry still think it's important to, for students to do geological mapping. Because actually, you know, the work in the oil and gas industry, they're not ever going to make a geological map in the way that you do uh, when you're a student. But it's working out a solution on the basis of incomplete data. Is what a, a field mapping is almost a perfect exercise for doing. And that, if you're trying to work out where that oil or gas is in the subsurface, you have incomplete data. So having a training in working in that way, that's, that's part of why field work, and in particular field mapping, is so important. It's because it's that, that problem-solving training on the basis of incomplete data, which is such a valuable skill. I would like to ask <clears throat> uh, something, uh, well, or comment, going back to the disability uh, subject. Uh, working with uh, associations in relation to disability, employability is the key word because it's actually 
the, the biggest challenge for them. And as you said, um, for many geologists, uh, they, they are not going to have a, a work based on the field and, and many branches in geology, they will be as good without ha having been in the field ever. So recognizing the enormous value of uh, field work, sometimes I wonder how much field work is necessary to be considered an employable geologist taking into account, I mean that if you are going to be working on mapping, you, you are going to have had quite a lot uh, of field work, actually much more than, than the one you can get in your degree. But if you are going to, I don't know, study fossils in a natural history museum or uh, interpreting, I don't know, XRD patterns. Yeah. Uh, so as, or, or from, from the perspective of the industry, I would like to know your opinion on uh, are these benchmarking, this, this benchmark of uh, how much field work uh, does a geologist have to have, mm -hmm. be realistic in terms of what translates into an employability for, for example, a disabled person? It, it, I think it will depend on the role that that geologist may have. But I'll go back to the point I made in response to and Andy's point about field field mapping. It, it's not so much, it's, it's the skill that you've learnt, that, that 3D perception skill that you get from doing the field, what you're trying to, they're trying to do with the virtual mapping. Maybe the virtual mapping can, can help provide, provide that. But it's, I, I think it's wrong to, to be thinking that it's a direct translation. Learning how to make a geological map is, is in itself only a, uh, an exercise you need to be able to do. It's what you learn in the process of making that geological map, of integrating different sorts of data, of uh, then using that very incomplete set of data to come to, to a solution. It's one of the things that makes geoscience so different from any other physical sciences is you know, we're more like historians, we're more like archaeologists because we have such incomplete data to work on. But unlike historians and archaeologists, we have to make economic decisions on the basis of that, that incomplete data. And I, I think you know, a lot of technology helps. Um, but I think, you know, and I, it was, the, the case would have perhaps been even stronger you know, 10, 20 years ago when the quality and resolution of subsurface data was nothing like what it is now. Now you can see huge amounts of detail on 3D seismic. But it's still only a uh, remote sensed set of, of, of data. And to, in order to be able to translate that remote sense, actually basic set of you know, of, of uh, sonic responses, translating that into geology actually does need a picture of the geology in your mind. You need to have seen that in the field. Now, maybe you can do it with virtual reality. I think that, that if, we, if every person being trained as a geologist was, was exposed to the full suite of uh, virtual mapping, LIDAR, you know, all, all the possible bits of technology that could be used to address this, then maybe the importance for field geology is reduced. I find it quite hard to think it will ever, uh, ever be completely replaced. I'm sorry to break up the poll. Oh, sorry, Edmund, yes. All right. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question, and I'm going to invite you to go away and think about it. And actually, although we've been talking about field work, what I think we're actually talking about is observation and relationships. Now, I will probably express this badly, but the person to whom you were trying to attribute the remark in terms of the best geologist is the person who's seen the most rocks, I think is H.H. H. Reed. But I, I think observation is actually a, a, an interesting thing, at least to think about. And we all go, and it doesn't matter whether we observe in the laboratory or in the field, with a whole series of prejudices, namely, what have we seen before? And that's the basis on which we observe and make interpretation. The skill is to see 
what somebody has not seen before and understand the meaning of that observation. Right, I'll leave you with that. We're going to go and have some coffee and we're going to come back in 15 minutes or so. Over coffee, would you please think about what you suggest we should talk about in the final session. There may be some themes, something that you want to explore. We can have those discussions together in this room. Although if some of you really feel that you want to explore your highly provocative idea in small groups, we could also think about doing that. But whatever we talk about in the final session, I think has to have a practical act aspect to it. Where do we go from here? I think we've had a wonderful meeting. It's all been very entertaining. But now we have to think about how we take this forward. So go and have some coffee. Come back with your idea so that we can find, say, three or four themes to explore each of them for 10 or 15 minutes. See you at 10 to 4 in here. Thank you.